following message was recorded at The Way. For additional messages and information, log on to our website, www.thewaycolumbus.com, or email us at thewaycolumbus at gmail.com. Now, get ready to hear a word from God. We'll give you an opportunity to give at the conclusion of service. Turn to Acts chapter 9. As you know, we have begun uh, a series of messages that Pastor Kendall and I will be ministering from, and prayerfully some of our ministers will also be ministering from, dealing with returning the church to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Can you turn me up a little bit, bro? Hallelujah. So, I'm going to go just a little further uh, in that message. Acts chapter 9, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. If you have that, indicate by saying, I have it. Amen. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Just in case you didn't know that the early Christians were called followers of... Okay. Because Jesus said, I am the... Oh, okay. You got it. Verse 3. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. He replied, but get up and go into the city. And you will be told what you must do. Verse 7. The men stood, the men, who, uh, the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Then Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. So far the reading of the scripture. Uh, let's look at St. John 20. St. John. Hallelujah. And 27 through 29. St. John 20, 27 through 29. Then he said to Thomas, this is Jesus speaking, put your finger here and observe my hands. Reach out to your hand and put it into my side. Don't be an unbeliever, but a believer. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Those who believe without seeing are blessed. So far, the reading of his holy word. 
And I want to talk just for a few moments in your hearing from the subject, the Damascus experience. The Damascus experience. Father, we ask you that you would bless our time in your word today. That there be no hindrances and no distractions, no disruptions, God, to your word coming forth with clarity and with power. We decrease that you might increase today. Speak through our minds, speak through my mouth today, God, in Jesus' name. And let your word find, God, fertile hearts where the soil is ripe and ready to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As you all, uh, many of you were here Friday night, you know that we are, uh, we spoke Friday night from the topic of return to Christ. Uh, we are returning to the true gospel, which is Christ. As we talked about Friday night, the uh, church has made a fundamental shift away from Christ being the center of our faith, the object of our faith. The undergirding of our faith, the, the stitches that hold our faith together. Uh, but, and, and because of this departure, we have seen the church diminish in influence, diminish in potency. Uh, when you think about impotence, men are more familiar with that type of condition because impotence means that you have lost your potency. Uh, generally, it means that a man has lost the ability to sustain an erection and to create a pregnancy, impetus, impotency. And the church has become impotent. The church has lost its ability to impregnate a dying world with the life of God. And the reason why the church has lost its uh, potency is because we have left away from the fundamental truth of the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. He is the substratum. He is the undergirding of our faith. He is the one uh, that everything that we do should spring from. He is the one who gives the message power. Y'all don't understand what I'm saying. Jesus is the one who gives the message power. The Bible teaches us that there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. The word saved means delivered transform, change, except by the name of Jesus. There's no other name. There's no other way to receive salvation. The transforming power of Jesus Christ is the only way. The Bible talks about that the first man, being Adam, was made a living soul. But the last man, Adam, which is Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit, meaning that he was not just able, he was not just given life, but he was able to give life. So if life is to be injected into this dying world, it will only be when we go back to preaching the cross. It will only be when we go back to preaching Christ. It will only be when we go back to bringing people not to our denominational affiliation, not to a good program, not to uh, our churches and our facilities, not to our auxiliaries and our outreaches, but into a real relationship with the man, Jesus Christ. This is... The place where the power has been lost. Because we preach a gospel absent of Christ. We preach a gospel that speaks to men's condition but gives them no way out. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm tired of going to church 
and, and, and we accept preaching from men and women of God under the guise of them keeping it real. But really what they're doing is placating to our weaknesses. You don't need somebody just to get up and tell you I can identify with your struggle. I got struggles too. You need somebody that says, you know what? I have had struggles in my life and I'm yet striving, but I know a man who is able to transform your life. I know a man who is able to put love down in your heart that you don't have the capacity to have in your own human. I know a man who is able to take a mind that has been perverted, a mind that has been burdened down, a mind that has been depressed and oppressed and suicidal and speak peace to that mind. I know a man. The church doesn't matter. Where the church is doesn't matter. Who the pastor is doesn't matter. It is who is the God of the church. And who is the God of the pastor. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. That's the stuff that matters. Because we follow men because of their charisma. We follow men because of their eloquence of speech. But when will we understand that as men and women of God, we are simply signposts. My job is not to point you to me. My job is not to have you wrapped up in my ability to articulate it, my ability to tantalize your emotions. My job is to have you look at me, but when you look at me, I'm pointing to him. I'm pointing to him. That is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who is a person? He's the person. He is the one that walked in hell and stripped hell of its rights to humanity for all who would accept and believe him. My God. My God. See, hell doesn't have a right to us. But the problem is, the only way to escape that is to accept the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. If you want to escape death, and he's talking about eternal death. If you want to escape death, which is separation from God, the only way to escape death, the only way to escape that separation is in me. That's the only way. So we can no longer simply introduce people to church. Church in and of itself without Christ being the central message is powerless. It's no more powerful than 12 steps to break addiction. Hold on. It's no more powerful than AA and all of these tools that the world has to try to help people be free from what you don't have the power to be free from absent of Jesus Christ. Right. We just become another social service. We just become another alternative in the multitude of alternatives there are out there to make your life better. My God, we can't introduce people just to church. We got to introduce them to Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. 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 So in the text that we read, we see a man named Saul. Everybody say Saul. I'm not going to be long. I'm going to wrap this in 15 minutes. We see a man named Saul. Saul was uh, of the Pharisaical order. Saul was an extremely pious and religious man. Saul was an extremely educated man. Saul had a form of godliness. 
But what Christ had come to do in the earth had not yet been revealed to his heart and to his mind. As we saw in Acts chapter 8 several weeks ago, when we talked about the persecution that hit the church, Saul was in the crowd when they stoned Stephen. Saul didn't pick up a rock. He didn't throw anything. He held the coats, but he was in complete agreement with the actions that had been taken. And he took on the mindset of the Pharisees who said, we must stamp out this Christianity. We got to kill this thing before it spreads any further. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. We got to kill this thing. And killing it meant either you got to kill the people or you have to get the people to renounce their faith. And so Paul took up the mantle against Christ. But the problem was is that Paul did not understand that his fight was against Christ. Y'all stay with me. He didn't understand. He thought he was stopping this radical group of people who were hanging on to the memory of a man who had been killed. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. He didn't realize that the man that they thought they had killed resurrected on the third day. And not only was he alive, but he was seated on the right hand of the father. He just thought he was killing this little radical uprising that didn't fit in with the Jewish culture, that didn't fit in with Judaism, that didn't fit in with the religious order of the day. My God. See, that's the problem with the world today, that they're attacking the church and attacking Christians. They don't realize that they're not just trying to stop some antiquated ideas. This is what they call them, antiquated ideas. They don't think that they're not just trying to stop this intolerant bunch of people who won't let people live their lives however they see fit, who always opening up their mouths and, and speaking about that there's a way to live and, and there's a way to salvation and there is a God and he is interested in the affairs they don't want to hear that so what do we do we don't really believe in this savior Uh, these radical people who are following a man that some say never existed oh y'all don't hear what I'm saying following a man who who was just a he was just a prophet after all y'all y'all don't hear what I'm saying they're follow, so they're attacking Christianity just like they were here in the book of Acts but understand that God has a way of getting to the one who is the furthest away. God has a way of getting to the one who cannot see the value in serving. God has a way, Jesus has a way of revealing himself in the midst of darkness. You didn't know, did you? You didn't realize it, that God works best in the dark. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. The Bible says that everything that was created was created by him and for him in the beginning. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. There, the earth was without form and it was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But wait a minute. The spirit of the Lord hovered across the face. Of, he works best in Uh, That's why we can't get afraid in dark times. That's why we can't get afraid as it looks like the world is becoming more and more increasingly evil and more and more increasingly anti-Christ. Oh, this is the stage he works on best. My God. That's why we can't get shook up when nobody at work is saved and nobody in the family is saved. It's all right. He's just setting the stage because he hovers over darkness. Ah, God. He hovers over darkness. He works best in the dark. Remember I told you a few weeks ago that light isn't light unless there's darkness. 
Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Light is in light unless there's darkness. So he is the he's the light of the world. So so in the in the text, Paul went to get permission, papers, legal right to persecute the saints, the Christians at Damascus. Paul was on a personal mission to shut this thing down. Y'all don't see, 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 that's why I don't get nervous because the devil's been trying to kill the church from the beginning. He's been trying to stamp this thing out. But God has released a principle as it relates to his people. We don't die, we multiply. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And it started all the way back in, in Egyptian captivity. Because in Egyptian captivity, to stop the growth of the people of Israel, they put over them taskmasters and they begin to persecute them and work them night and day. But the more that they oppressed them, the more they grew. It's something about a believer that can grow in conditions that nobody else can grow in. It's something about being a Christian that makes you be able to thrive in situations that swallow other people up. Y'all don't see what I'm saying. It's something about being a Christian that makes you be able to stand in things that crush other people's lives. So he got permission to go to Damascus. I'm coming to a close. He got permission to go to Damascus to persecute the church. And off he went. But how, did, how many of you remember the day that you were in the process of going your own way, yet something interrupted your life? Uh, you were in the process of doing your own thing. You were an enemy of the cross and you didn't know it. Oh, my God. You were living unto your own means. You were living unto your own way. You were going and doing your, you were getting it in the best that you could. But one day, Jesus shows up and interrupts everything. Paul is on his way to Damascus to kill and arrest Christians. And the Bible says that a great light shined all around Paul and knocked him off of his beast. I want you to tell, I want to tell you something. See, some people get nervous about, uh, uh, you know, have you ever uh, see, looked at somebody and, and said, uh, oh, you better stop doing that. You're going to get struck. I, and I don't want to be around you if God strike you. Right. See, understand God don't miss. <laughs> if God trying to get you, he going to get you. Paul was doing his thing surrounded by people, but the light encompassed him. Oh, God. See, that was what happened to many of us. We were with our friends, and we were kicking it, and we were partying, and we were sleeping around, and we were doing our thing. And in the midst of what, where we were heading, the direction we were heading into, God singled us out. He singled us out. So a light shone around Paul and knocked him from his beast. See, when you really have an encounter with the glorious light of the gospel, it knocks you off your beast. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. It knocks you on your back. It knocks you off of whatever you were riding and wherever you were. It knocks you and incapacitates you and arrests you. He was going to arrest Christians having no idea he was about to be arrested first. The gospel is the power of the gospel arrests you. It stops you right in the middle of your sinful lifestyle. It stops you right in the middle of what you're going to do. And so Paul was perplexed, not knowing what was going on. 
and he heard a voice as he was on the ground saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Oh, why are you persecuting me? He said, persecuting who? My God. I I'm just going to kill these Christians. See, Paul got his first revelation here in the text that when you lay your hand on the body of Christ, you're laying your hand on Christ himself. What is the lesson here? The lesson here is that Christ is in me. Oh. And when you attack me, you're not attacking me. You are attacking Christ. My God. See, see, that should encourage you. That should encourage you. People don't realize who you really are. People don't realize that put their mouth on you. People don't realize that speak out against what you're doing, that they're not really persecuting you, but they're persecuting Jesus. He said, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. And he replied, but get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Then Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Understand that when you have a true experience with the Lord Jesus, that the light is so bright that it blinds you in the natural from being able to see things the way you used to see them. A real encounter with Christ makes your eyesight change. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. A real encounter with Christ transforms what you see and gives you a new perspective. And so Paul got up and he couldn't see because his eyes were blinded. And they took him by the hand into the city of Damascus. Now let me, let me insert this. I read John chapter 20 verses 27 through 29 to illustrate what was happening here. Thomas was one of the original 12 disciples. And when Jesus was crucified, Thomas's faith was shipwrecked. It was shipwrecked. And when Jesus rose from the dead and appeared before his disciples, Thomas was not there. Thomas was not there. And when Thomas got there, the disciples told him what had happened, and Thomas said, nah, nah, I don't believe it. He said, unless I see him with my own eyes and touch him with my own hands, I won't believe. Let me encourage those of you who feel like you have a struggle in your faith. God doesn't leave you just because you have momentary bouts of unbelief. Oh, my God. God, oh, that should make somebody happy. That, that though I might struggle with the will of God sometimes, and though I might struggle with believing what he said was going to happen, that Jesus is loving and merciful and gracious enough to come back and minister to me right in the point of my unbelief. Thank you, Lord. This is what happened with Thomas. 
he touched Jesus. He handled him. And he said, yes, this is, this is, this is him. This is our Lord. This is our God. And Jesus said something that would propel the church as we know it today into its path to the end of the age. Watch this. He said, blessed are those who believe and they don't see. This is what happened to Paul. Paul, unlike the original apostles, never saw Jesus with his eyes. Y'all. All Paul saw was the light. But the light is the gospel. And the gospel is Jesus. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. So Paul showed us that the next dispensation of the church would be that people would be exposed to the light of the gospel. And though they had not physically seen him, through the light of the gospel, he would be revealed to their hearts and to their minds. And that the power of the gospel is so strong that Jesus said, look, I ain't got to be here no more. Y'all understand my work is done. I was just supposed to initiate this thing and pour myself into a few people, but I'm going to give you myself in the form of my gospel so that when you declare me, you will introduce people to me who have not physically seen me and the power of the message Y'all don't see what I'm saying. The power of the gospel is enough to change the life even though they don't have the physical person of Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel changed Paul's life radically. He was converted. Let me give you another few points and then I'm done. Understand That the fervor that Paul went after the Christians with was what Jesus wanted for himself. Okay, y'all stay with me. Because some of us don't understand this. That many of us went hard when we was in the world. Hello? I I mean, went hard. When you wanted it, you went after it. And there wasn't nothing that could stop you. Let me bring it closer. When you wanted him, you went after him. And there was nothing that could stop you. Even if he belonged to somebody else. (sighs) Understand that when you encounter the gospel, God changes your desire, but he don't change the drive. Ah, when, when, you, when you experience the gospel, he transforms your direction, but he uses the personality that he gave you. Oh, see, 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 God is not interested in turning us into carbon copies of one another. If God made you a certain kind of thing, if you was the life of the party when you were out in the world, if you was the one who was quick to get into the fight out in the world, God says, see, I'm going to shine a light in your life that's not going to take the fight out of you. I'm just going to change your opponent. Thank you. Oh, my God. I'm talking about today a Damascus experience. That when the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ comes into your life, he takes what the enemy used to use for evil and use it. Paul's life was radically changed and radically turned around. But see, 
Paul's heart was the thing that was transformed because he went for God as hard as he did for the thing that he was in before. I come to tell you today that when you have a real experience with God, he changes your drive. He changes your heart. He changes your approach. He changes you, but he takes those things that he gave you that were perverted by sin and perverted by the enemy. And he says, give me that. Give me that drive. Give me that ride or die. I'm going to use that and I'm going to make you go out and I'm not going to send you to the Jews like the other apostles were comfortable with doing. I'm going to take you out of the places that you were comfortable in and I'm sending you to a group of people who know how to get it in too. And I'm going to cause the light of the gospel that's in your life to impact their life. See, everybody can't go into the rough places. Some of us, have, we didn't sin hard enough. That wasn't really our being. That wasn't really our thing. But some of us know what it is to get down and dirty. Some of us know what it is to get it in. But the Damascus experience will take that thing and flip it and make you effective. Where other people have no effect because they can't relate. Oh my God. Oh my God. Paul went to the places where the other apostles didn't want to go, where the heathens hung out. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Where there was pagan worship and idolatry. Paul said, I'm okay with that because I know what it is to have an idol because Judaism was my idol and I missed the revelation of Jesus Christ. But now that the gospel showed up, it changed my vision and now I'm going to redirect my passions. I come to tell you today, God has come today to redirect some passions. My God. My God. God has pulled some of us out of depths because the depth that you were in in sin is the same depth that it's going to take to reach some of these people out here. See, honey, you can't forget where you came from. You can't forget your testimony because people out here, they don't respond to people who are all lily white Christian who act like they don't know what it is. But they need somebody who can walk up into the club and say, I know what the club is all about but let me show you a light that's brighter than anything that you've seen in the club brighter than anything that you've seen with drugs brighter than anything the Damascus experience was so powerful that Paul who was the greatest enemy of Christ became his greatest ally for Paul wrote a third <laughs> my God don't you tell me God is intimidated by somebody's condition don't you tell me that the gospel is not powerful enough and not strong enough Jesus will walk up into any circumstance any situation any heart any mind any marriage and turn it around who's had a Damascus experience in this place stand on your feet my life thank you for listening we hope this message has enriched your life for more information log on to our website www.thewaycolumbus.com or email us at thewaycolumbus at gmail.com and remember Jesus is the way